I'm here today to talk about crisis and possibility. I've been working on some incredible things uh, with an incredible community this year, and I'd like for you to understand uh, some of the possibilities that we've seen, most of them relating to an earthquake that happened in January in uh, Haiti. Most of you probably remember that as uh, being a difficult time, uh, but maybe didn't have uh, quite so many ways to engage it. I'd like to talk about survival or resiliency, to use the language from other participants. And I'd like to talk about something very boring, information management. And we'll get to why the box is here in just one second. But uh, ultimately, the question is, I think, what motivates us? And all of our conversations about the hospital design, to me, those issues resolve to questions of what do people want to do? Because it's all well and good if we say that we think people need light or people should have you know, these experiences in the hospital. But what is it that's ultimately going to determine whether or not that hospital is ever built? It will det be determined by whether or not people actually want it. So to complement that, and the other side of the same coin, I'd like to talk about what terrifies us. And this seems like it might be uh, counterintuitive, but we'll see how I think that they are uh, the same idea. And ultimately, I'd like to look at what's possible now, in keeping with the, the theme of, of the presentation today. So going back a little ways uh, to 7 million years ago, uh, probably uh, a little too far for a 20-minute presentation to do thoroughly, so we'll skip ahead to the exciting part, say 50,000 years ago, <laughs> when we start to recognize something uh, kind of human and something that we could actually uh, understand as being a form of cooperation and, and communication. I'm a technologist, a programmer. I work with people and do community development. So for me, the, the idea of paperwork and doing information management and the, the science of how the information flows through a, a system of, of people from, from one person to the next is a question of, of how we have developed the capacity uh, to communicate. And 50,000 years ago, something happened. I don't know. Jared Diamond calls it the, the great leap forward, but that sounds a little uh, too much to me. Something happened, and we can look back and see uh, different artifacts that are recognizable to us at this time. Here's a cave painting. It actually looks like horses. And before this, we, we don't really have a sense of, of, of what people were actually doing. So this is the emergence of communication and different styles appealing to, to different interests and people leaving indelible marks on their uh, environment. The Venus of Willendorf is an incredibly powerful piece of sculpture, I think, uh, fertil fertility symbol. And uh, it's from 24,000 years ago. So if we consider this the earliest object of human com communication that we recognize, uh, then we have a baseline for understanding how this is changing and where we're at today. So 7,000 years ago, we started to see the earliest development of proto-writing, that is, writing we don't know what it means. And this script was found on some urn and somehow captured. You can see it's a little rough. It's kind of sketchy. It looks like real handwriting. Someone hasn't really bothered to formalize this, or we don't really understand how it was used. No one knows exactly what this says. The evolution of cuneiform and other early forms of systems, you can start to see, look at the, the etch marks. You can see the, 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 the sophistication of the tool that they're using and the standardization around certain things. So that within a certain uh, thousand years or so, uh, around that 7,000 year mark, we start to see this uh, representation of ideas and the ability to communicate with each other and to, to participate, really, in the sense that you're talking about. To participate together in the, the cohesion of ideas that's in efficient, dense, and indelible. That is, it communicates in a way that's, that's much uh, better by our standards, honestly. And so we, out of this, start to develop concepts that are fundamental to our societies today, such as paper books and libraries. But the astonishing thing about this, to me, is not that we were able to achieve it. It's that it's such a small slice of our whole perspective as, as, a, as a culture. So if you think about that, what does that really imply for the challenges that we have today? If we're working on these things all in a context of the internet and, and ever uh, increasing communication, what does it mean that on an evolutionary scale, we have this only at the very last second, only yesterday? By the 1500s, there's 200 printing centers in Europe. I think that's comparable to a couple blocks in Manhattan, maybe, in terms of the number of kinkos. But these people who were doing this work were providing a service that was so valuable that it became a cornerstone of some revolutionary movements, among the most famous, the Protestant Reformation, which shook up the whole power structure of Europe and the Catholic Church and literally changed our relationship to God. The power structures that emerged out of that were as a printing house around 1700, 1700. And you start to really see how this is connected to the change in ideas around the time of the Enlightenment in Europe, as well as other places in the world. 
By 1900, again, so recent on that seven million year perspective, communication starts to take on two really distinct forms, I think. One is cooperative. The strands of cooperation that we began to see, we started to recognize the earliest forms of the family 50,000, six million years ago. So it, uh, communication is cooperation, but it's also conflict. And people begin to understand how communication, those printing centers can be used to manipulate people's ideas and to push people into certain different groups. To start to get really creative, you had to come up with these nifty slogans. And all of this has become a very sophisticated language that we take for granted every day, right down to the color of the carpets and the arrangement of the speakers on the stage. These are all forms of communication which are mediated now through these, these uh, systems. And so mass communication evolves out of this. And here's where my role comes in as a web developer and programmer. Uh, I, I'm fascinated in how mass communication changed with radio and then television and then networking ultimately, I think, is the best way to describe the systems that are happening underneath. And so we can start to talk about network theory as a way to understand the dynamics and the baselines and the possibilities. Metcalf's law is a great one for understanding how the network behaves. Metcalf said that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of nodes on the network. That is, two phones is a nice conversation, but five is really exciting, and then you get 12 and you've got this huge uh, growth and capacity. And so in terms of resilience, we can see, aha, here's a great way to lean on something in order to, you know, we're literally connecting each other. But of course the network, and Metcalf has been widely criticized and misused, the network is not even. And so it's valuable to reconsider who is the network that we're talking about, who are we addressing, and who is the empty chair for. And our network is uneven in a way that makes our design decisions very problematic sometimes because we assume that others are also equally networked. But we've achieved a, a sufficient penetration of the network or distribution of the network and inclusiveness of the network now, the, the literal network of being able to pick up the phone and call people. Because of Metcalf's law, that is uh, the number of transistors, I can't remember the exact phrasing of, of Gordon Moore's law, but if you'll note the scale on the axis here, this is a major increase, and, and this plots, uh, this affirms Gordon Moore's observation in the 60s that we, we are dealing with an incredible breakneck rate of change. And you can see this all around, the, the challenge of understanding this actually and being able to work within an environment that's changing so quickly is actually very, very serious. But the, on the positive side, we're able to do incredible things. One of my heroes, Doug Engelbart, uh, interaction designer and uh, the inventor of the mouse actually, I, I think was, is one of the most famous people who was able to take advantage of this and really stimulate our possibility for creative exploration. Can you imagine using your computer without your mouse? Doug Engelbart, in the same way, was really fundamental in organizing how people can collaborate online. He has some really one. I uh, invite you to check them out. And as a historical uh, doppelganger or, or contrast to him, uh, Robert J. Oppenheimer, a fascinating historical figure, father of the atomic bomb is his nickname. Uh, not something that he sat well with because he was a very sensitive and, and kind and, and a humanitarian, really. Uh, when he realized what he had done, he said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And he's right, this is our condition. We have achieved the capacity for annihilation of our planet. And we do it blithely. We, we are achieving something that we're not even aware of and we're pushing things around through transistor tubes and through resistors and through relays and through people ultimately that has an impact that is sometimes incredibly damaging. It uh, facilitates us to have uh, less personal relationships. We, we become atomized and uh, exist in a world that allows us to do great harm without even realizing it. We're able to send 16-year-olds into war now. But we're also capable of faster and bigger peace, and the same challenge gives us the possibility. What terrifies us is what motivates me. And I believe that we have the possibility of achieving incredible social change as evidenced by recent social history. The civil rights movement in the United States, culminating with 1964 Civil Rights Act, speaks for itself. The fact that these beatniks got together and were able to do this. <laughs> It's incredible, it's really amazing. And it's something that we can take inspiration from every day. But if you look again at the history and the evolution of our ideas and our, our ability to work together, uh, what happened? These people didn't have computers. What were they working with? How do we take lessons from them? What are they really doing when they're sitting around these tables? And to me, I, I see that there's something, I think all of us are, understanding here and implicitly in the conversation that the technology is the possibility, but we also have to get through it and move beyond it to understand that these things, 
Paper, books, libraries, postal systems, church basements can all be as fundamental as being able to send a packet from here to there infinitely and instantly. By 1970, the network evolved. We actually had uh, copper wires communicating back and forth between both coasts, incredible. Most of it was uh, military industrial educational complex and they were figuring out things and didn't really know what they were doing, but they stumbled into this way of sending information that suddenly, I and mean, this is just a few years later, suddenly the network is growing beyond all expectation and increasing our ability to really work together. And programmers have some incredible insights in how to work fluidly together with information because they've been, been dealing with some of these issues for a long time. And those things are not intuitive to a lot of people. Some of the fallout of the development of the network in the 70s and 80s was uh, new partnerships, different types of groups coming together. Here's Duke and the University of North Carolina communicating with all these different people. This is the beginning of the internet. This is originally a map of, of Usenet. And also we develop a new leadership. But now we can start to see that the topology of the network and the shape of those partnerships uh, doesn't necessarily bring out the greatest leadership. Here's Bill Gates lounging on his fortunes. And it also creates a new sense of culture. And if culture is the source of motivation, then culture is where we should be looking to create change that would be able to achieve something that we want to be able to, to do. And the culture didn't necessarily turn into some divine inspired thing. A lot of times it was very mundane. Here's an uh, ad for you know, computer geekery culture. It hasn't necessarily expanded to all these uh, different areas of possibility because it looks like this. You know, it looks like the early web. It looks like Gopher, if you remember Gopher. It looks like Mosaic, eventually, which is a little bit more enticing. And then, suddenly, we realize, wait a second, Mosaic's ugly, but actually we can publish everywhere in the world now. That's new, right? And it can happen instantly. And it's unlimited. So we've been handed a possibility through the development of the network. What's left? Well, again, seven million years. If we plotted the capacity on a line, we would see this massive spike at the end, just after writing at some point. If we zoom in, though, it becomes a little bit more manageable. And I think that we can uh, think about Gordon Moore's law of how capable processors are becoming and um, uh, doubling every two years, I think, was his rule. But we can see that there's a leveling off uh, there was a graph earlier that showed the advance of technology eventually going down and user experience going right up at the same time because we start to understand what the, the network is capable of. And so I see us subsisting somewhere over here as if we were over here, maybe. And so we're still excited about writing and all those things are, are, are relevant. But, you know, the huge growth is over. So who's waiting for progress to solve these problems for us? If we don't have it already within our hand at a time when we can publish instantly, infinitely, everywhere in the world, then what are we waiting for? This is our capacity to catch up to. And so my impression as a designer and developer of someone who works on the web is that all these tools already exist. And at times I want to go back and just work with a photocopier and make zines because I don't see any fundamental difference really other than the fact that I can distribute my information uh, quickly. So it's a question of capacity versus reality. And this is both deeply uh, uh, problematic. You know, we don't want to really point this out. We don't want to acknowledge that we're wasting some of our uh, existing uh, capacity with, with a photocopier, of course. We just want the new photocopier. <laughs> and uh, we, we want to be able to feel like we're waiting on something to come to us. But in fact, we have a lot of unrealized potential. And we also have some real challenges to deal with, which are the sources of our uh, delay. So I think that those challenges are individualism and atomization, disassociation, trivialization of issues. We're so overwhelmed with information now that we've developed a, a, a evolutionary uh, barrier to being able to process this. Because remember, evolutionary speaking, we never had the ability to process it in the first place. It's only natural that we ignore other communities and that we're atomized and that we are looking out for our, our individual lives. Because on a seven million year scale, what really matters is that my family's alive. So, design leadership. Where are we gonna take lessons from in order to get through this? Here's one incredible thing. If you wanna talk about managing information, uh, this is great, it's a new Bloomberg terminal designed by IDEA. Uh, but apologies to them, you know, I'm a little tired of seeing all these advances in the financial sector. Where's the uh, human, uh, the humane, humanitarian versions of this? This data is all about moving money around and that just gets so boring so fast. Here's another dashboard. I mean, financial people really know how to deal with data rapidly in order to make change in the world, right? Who does it better? But where are these tools for our healthcare system? You know, they don't really exist. 
not to mention our electoral system, our environmental systems, all of these things. So when you get back down to it, environmentally speaking, uh, ecologically speaking, and, and evolutionarily speaking, like when we're talking about survival of our species at this point, isn't it time that we really got beyond this and we started to see these tools? Well, sometimes these things percolate into our consciousness without us really wanting to. And for uh, various reasons, a lot, of, a lot of diverse reasons actually that are potentially, we'll, we'll talk at the bar later, but the, the earthquake in Haiti was an incredible moment for my community and for uh, people around me who were empowered to work over the network and to really come to terms with the fact that we're all sharing membership in this human society. And yes, it's related to the fact that Haiti was there, but I mean, for many of us, Haiti is a, a, a blind spot. We, we don't have any awareness. Uh, but at, at the time of the earthquake, we lived through a really terrifying thing together with a bunch of uh, Haitians, actually. There's a huge Haitian diaspora in the United States. And so uh, I work with some groups that do different types of volunteerism online and work with uh, the, 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 the movement of information. And uh, all of them are terrified by this. All of them are motivated by it. And all of us are sure that we can do more. This is the condition that terrified us, and this is the motivation. This is the message that went out on a website, haiti.ushahidi.com. Are you in Haiti? Text 4636 with your location in need. Right there, just in the first sentence of these two lines, you have an incredible thing. One, people can actually communicate. There's cell phones all over Haiti. I don't know how familiar you are with the, the, the penetration rates of uh, mobile phones, but it's kind of incredible. And report missing emergencies and, and per, report persons, uh, excuse me, emergencies and missing persons. Like, what a basic call to action. It seems so simple that we would want to reach out. And this is the artifact that we created. And the box contains all of the reports. This box holds about 4,500 reports that we received if you print them out. And uh, I think that those alone, standing there, printed as text, are something that's, that's really incredible. And uh, these are some of the different interfaces. I just want to ground the conversation and what this actually looked like when it happened. Here's a bunch of reports coming in. You can see the different types. This is the context that we were working in. 230,000 people were dying and are still dying. The Haitian crisis is, is ongoing. Here's an example report. Two persons are trapped under the rubble at Caribbean market. One of them is using this number. What are you going to do with this person's phone number? Do you want to call them? If you had to, what would you do? And now, what would you do with this one? Because they're still coming. They're just coming. And they were just coming and coming and coming and coming. And in, in that moment, I had one of the most incredible professional realizations. It changed my career because I understood then that these voices were not just other programmers online, that everyone can be online soon. And that if we're thinking a little bit ahead, we need to take this into account as a source of inspiration. Here's another one. I located my 85-year-old. Thank God. God, how motivating is that? How incredible is that? And the fact that you received this just moments ago. This came in on the 20th of January, and we're all sitting around the table on the 20th of January. It lands on the table. What do we do with it? If it was on paper, and we had highlighters and postage stamps, what would we do with it then? And the scale of the reports was overwhelming to the team that formed spontaneously to deal with them. We printed them just to see what are we working with here. And in fact, this box is one of 10 boxes. It's the only one that uh, has uh, uh, verified data that actually made it onto the map. Out of 50,000 reports, that box containing about 5,000 is what actually ended up doing. So I propose that as a way of understanding and uniting our awareness of the way that we're working, that this box represents one unit of work. But now looking forward, we can understand as the systems come online that there will be millions more units. There will be billions of units. There will be everyone speaking and vying for their own family's success. So what does that imply for the way that we work? How do we have to increase our resiliency as a network to be able to deal with that in moments of crisis? Because we all live in crisis, and we all are able to participate now, and it's incumbent upon all of us to work on these things. So that, to me, is a little terrifying. But it's also quite empowering to recognize you know, that we're, we're going to be able to deal with this. So at once, terrifying and motivating. This is the kernel of what I was talking about. This is a group of people that came together around something that just scared the shit out of them because they didn't know what to do. They basically dropped out of class. They basically stopped work for months at a time. People who weren't in Haiti, in Haiti and didn't know Haitians directly realized that they could reach out over the network and start interacting with this. And this is why. No matter what, it's so much better than sitting there and feeling helpless. So this capacity isn't just about being altruistic. We can actually participate in systems that make us feel more engaged in the world. And this could have a profound effect on someone's life. 
Yes, there are psychological costs of working in this context, but if you can find something that's important to you and reorient your work around that, then you may end up being much healthier. And so this information management cycle, this is a very traditional diagram here, a very traditional understanding. What happens when we apply this to the entire world? And we're hearing everyone. Actually, it gets a little complicated. This is a map of uh, some of the organizational relationships. But again, three million networked survivors is the point here. These are people who are on the ground. Not everybody has a cell phone, but everybody's within walking distance of a cell phone. Everybody, every camp had a cell phone in it. That's incredible to me. That's huge. Information really is power. And so back to the civil rights movement. Again, what's really happening here? I see a bunch of paperwork. And to me, paperwork has gone from being the last thing that I want to do to something that I'm determined to understand. And I encourage you to think about that in your work. The information is the opportunity. These people sitting around this table are working on a critical issue. So again, design lessons. I think that there's different ways of working. You can look like this, feel like uh, IBM or Hewlett Packard, apologies if there are any major corporations in the world, uh, but this is just wrong. This isn't the way that humans work together because you're just putting yourself at the top of that pyramid, let's be honest, and I drew that pyramid for a couple of years before I realized how problematic that was. To me, from the open source perspective, I see leadership emerge, a core team come out around that, and then I thought, oh, okay, this crowdsourcing thing sounds really cool. What if we just expanded that? Well, I think that's wrong too. That's a little bit blown out. What if we just got stuff done? Crowdsourcing seems like a problem to me. This is what I saw out of Haiti. It's a bunch of people coming together. It looks like tadpoles in a pond. It's, it's organic, it's ugly. This guy is like off in the corner. He doesn't know what he's doing. That company's got too much leadership. People are doing different things, but we're collaborating. It's not automation. And so when you hear people talk about crowdsourcing, please remember this presentation and, and understand that work always gets done in a very small team with dedicated leadership. But, the raw possibility of this is these systems. So quickly here, here's one, here's another, here's another. These are incredible things that came out all within January. Here's another one that's been worked on since then. Here's a basic spreadsheet that people were doing media monitoring with. You're passing around information and creating a greater awareness for the first responders. And so you can divide tasks into uh, this type of system where you have information, you need information, and you can participate in so many different ways. We've, we really feel like we've just begun to explore the possibility. Here's one taxonomy that evolved out of the, the Haitian work uh, very, very uh, quickly. And uh, all these different approaches, I think, are, are inspiring examples. Uh, and again, we can talk about these at the bar. But returning to the idea of your, uh, your own personal crisis as a, as a way of closing, I would encourage you to remember that crisis as it is understood through the media, through the newspapers and CNN, is that we have these terrifying events that happen once every once in a while. Some miners down a well, uh, a tsunami happens, an explosion, but in fact we know that the world is constantly in a state of crisis. And so I encourage you to look towards your own form of crisis and to think about something really terrible, whether it's the death of your parents or the, your own health or maybe it's your cat or the lack of proper strawberry ice cream in your neighborhood, something that really terrifies you is actually potentially the source of something that you can really do incredible work on. And if you look at all these different types of crises, you can see some that are so slow that they're almost invisible. That's a cultural conflict. It's a kind of glacial cadence. And then on the other side, there's things that just happen. And you know, it turns out that I'm not the right person to be on call for an earthquake style of emergency. I think personally that to me this is all about education and so I'm starting to see the world as a, a, a network of people who are learning to work together and I entreat you to uh, think about the perspective. What terrifies you? What motivates you? Thank you very much.